Good afternoon. Welcome to our Thursday afternoon colloquium. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce our colloquium speaker, Professor Jia Chiao. Uh, she's an associate professor at the Carlson Center of Imaging Science at Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, she holds a doctorate in electrical and computer engineering from UT Austin and a master's in precision uh, instruments and fine mechanics from Tsinghua University. She also holds a business degree MBA from uh, Simon Graduate School of Business at University of Rochester. Uh, at RIT, she leads uh, the Advanced Optical Fabrication Instrumentation Metrology Lab, where her team works on, uh, works on ultra-fast lasers for advanced photonics, optical fabrication, uh, additive manufacturing, optical metrology, and instrumentation, among other topics. Before joining RIT, she served as a lead system scientist at the DOE-funded lab for laser en energetics at University of Rochester from 2005 to 2013. Among her many accomplishments, uh, she conceived an interferometric grating uh, tiling technique that led uh, the team that demonstrated the world's first 1.5 meter tiled grating pulse compressor. Uh, with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Xiao. And I'll hand it over to her. Thank you very much for the yeah, introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, can you all hear me? Good. So um, it's, it's my great pleasure to be here um, to introduce my work over the years. So I have uh, cross-sectional experience uh, in industry, uh, DOE funding lab and academic signing. So I, I especially want to bring students that experience for the future career direction you may take in different sectors. And the topic my talk is on ultra-fast lasers for photonics fabrication and additive manufacturing. Optical differentiation waveform sensing and coherent phasing of deformal gratings. So that covers my experience uh, in uh, photonics, ultra-fast lasers, and imaging. And the picture on the left you, you're seeing is the uh, Omega EP laser uh, funded by uh, Department of Energy located at University of Rochester. So this is a laser I was working on as a laser scientist. Um, when the day I was hired, this was all empty. And the size of this laser has the size of a football court. It's gigantic. And then after I worked there for eight years uh, doing various type of uh, adaptive optics, uh, waveform sensing um, and uh, imaging. I moved to RIT as a faculty. Now I'm putting everything on a three by one yard optical table. <laughs> what I want to emphasize here is the, uh, the principles uh, you're going to apply in your future job. Actually, no matter large or small optics, they are the same. So the uh, so I, I enjoyed the uh, interdisciplinary research experience across the ultra-fast laser systems, metrology, precision controls, and photonics. So the, uh, the top row are the uh, projects I work on, or my team, the team I have led, including interferometric uh, coherent facing of meter-sized diffraction gratings, and adaptive optic design. This is a deformable optic design for deformable mirror. Uh, deformable grating can also be used for deformable uh, mirrors for telescopes. And the uh, realized 1.5 meter diffraction grating pulse compression to generate kilojoule energy petabar lasers. And this is the optical differentiation waveform sensing I'm going to talk about today. Uh, in situ laser damage detection, this is the dark imaging. In terms of phot photonics and imaging, um, this is the area that we put everything down into a palm size from the football court laser system. And this is a Yishao grading based uh, eight channel multi-mode uh, WDM, can be used for uh, data communication in metropolitan area. And the same principle can be applied to uh, waveguide based Yishao grading that's done by uh, lithography. And this is the uh, uniform illumination for high speed street camera. Uh, often can be used for ultra-fast uh, imaging and also the ultra-fast laser diagnostics. And infrared uh, uh, audit lens. So the, uh, from all these things can be applied to a large laser system or even a small laser material interaction. But the bases are all applied, the different, uh, the different part of optics, photonics, and lasers. 
So the, uh, the three projects I'm going to talk about is the first one is the ultra-fast laser, uh, related ultra-fast laser system, physical model, and process for advanced optics photonics fabrication. And the second one is the uh, optical differentiation waveform sensing for free from metrology, then the coherent phasing and adaptive rating. For the ultra-fast laser for photonics fabrication, that's an active di uh, research direction uh, in my lab right now. And we have done femtosecond laser processing for silicon, and uh, silicon is the base for silicon photonics. Uh, we have seen a thermal surface artifact that require heat mitigation and during the frontal second laser processing. We have numerically simulated the, uh, the heat simula uh, accumulation process and that model can be used to optimize laser parameters to get desired processing. And most of all, uh, because this is a highly interdisciplinary research, we have built a unique uh, cluster of competitiveness consisting of 10 in industrial, academic, government, uh, governmental entities to advance ultra-fast laser-based photonics fabrication. So laser radiation can offer flexible forming and polishing of optical components and additive manufacturing parts. I start off with laser polishing of additive manufacturer parts because of the, uh, the best um, manufacturer, additive manufacturer metal parts, the surface error is on the tens of microns. And it's lacking of integrated technology to, to polish the surface. And then I realized that uh, laser can be used to polish uh, optic surface. Uh, this is a demonstration by, from Harvard Laser Institute. Uh, on the flat surface, they have also demonstrated laser polishing of a spherical surface. And in terms of freeform optics, I met several students who work on freeform uh, optics polishing because freeform rotationally is not symmetric. So in terms of the registration, is a, uh, you have to put it from a different platform for manufacturing, grinding, and metrology. Many freeform optics are done actually manually. This is one of 11 freeform optics used for scuba uh, X-ray observatory, and it's polished manually. The ultra-fast laser radiation can also be used to write 3D photonic waveguide. This is photonic lantern um, to give you flexibility. It can be used to weld um, glass to silicon or glass to glass. This can be used for uh, attached fiber to waveguide. Um, this is done by spot welding, can also be used to weld small optics. Because when you want to build a compact free from a uh, base system or any optical system, many situations you want to get rid of epoxy, and you want to connect glass to glass or glass to metal or glass to silicon. So ultra-fast laser have high potential to make breakthrough for photonic device fabrication and integration. And this is just the example I have mentioned that um, when right now the uh, fibers is attached to silicon wave by epoxy, and <coughs> the potential disruptive technology is to use ultra-fast laser to bond the uh, silicon, um, to bond the glass fiber to the silicon directly uh, through, the sp uh, through spot welding. <coughs> Deterministic laser-based fabrication requires understanding and control of complex laser material interaction process. So this research is highly interdisciplinary. <coughs> we can model the, uh, the uh, high intensity spatial profile of a laser pulses. <coughs> then the pulse is being injected into the surface and promote the uh, electrons from valence band to the conduction band. Depends, on the, uh, uh, depends upon the, uh, one, uh, the band gap and the photon energy. And so that lead to either linear absorption and or nonlinear absorption, bring more free electrons into the conduction band that give you the ones uh, avalanche avalanche uh, ionization. The whole process accumulate is going to generate plasma. The plasma force is going to further interact with the surface. That will give you different mechanism, laser welding, um, the uh, refractive index change, and void generation to modify the structure and property of the, uh, the optics. A frontal second laser system was constructed uh, in my lab and through a collaborative effort with the industry uh, including laser metrology industry. This is a frontal second laser 
uh, at 1030 can, o can also be frequency double to 515. And through a beam ex uh, expansion and control system, uh, in combination with a high scanning uh, beam scanning system, this can be used to do glass welding or cutting or polishing. So the initial experiments, you will think that the advantage of photocycle laser is it's so fast. It's on the time scale of 10 to minus 15 seconds. It's supposed to be <coughs> cold processing. There's no heat accumulation. But that's a wrong assumption that will only occur when you have a material compatible process. When you, have, you, can, you can have a determinist uh, processing. The first thing we saw is that we saw our uh, effective laser processing on silicon surface. That's represented by the trench of the right color. <coughs> we also have seen our surface, artificial surface rising, rise, the blue color. And this is a good and bad. The good is we saw effective laser material removal through photosecond laser. And the bad side is we got something we really did not want to intend to have. So we started investigation why we have the surface rising. Um, and the initial hypothesis was that there's an oxygen growth, or there could be potential melting as well. So we conduct our uh, energy dispersive X-ray uh, spectral measurement. And that confirmed that besides the uh, base material silicon, we have seen our three order magnitude increase in oxygen and carbide. And the increased oxygen content was found at the location of material parallel. And we understand that ox oxidization will happen around um, 700 degree for silicon. So the thermal effect must be indicated to enhance processing quality. That means if you just take a final second laser, you're going to see this effect that you don't want uh, for any laser welding or processing. So we build a model, a uh, thermal model, surface temperature evolution, evolution ultrafast laser ablation experiment was predicted using a numerical model. So this model is uh, quite simple in theory. Uh, you simulate the laser energy deposition using the Gaussian spatial distribution. And the temperature relation versus the energy is uh, really proportional to the material density, thermal capacity. This is the processing volume. After you get the temperature rise uh, from each pulse, we need to understand spatially and temporally how the temperature dissipated over time. So this model gave us ability to understand, uh, given different time, a different pulse, how the surface temperature rise and how it dissipates and how the heat is accumulated. So with this model, we simulate the experimental condition with a pulse energy of 10 microjoule and 2, mi two megahertz uh, with a very slow scanning speed of 1.5 millimeter per second. And we found out that only after the fourth pulse, the surface temperature exceeded the oxidation temperature. And after 10th pulse, the surface temperature exceeds the melting temperature. That validates uh, what we have seen. Uh, actually, just by using this model, we can predict that given this laser processing condition, we're going to see oxidation, we're going to see melting. And that was actually validated by the experimental uh, measurement. So the optimized laser parameters are required to avoid thermal processing conditions. So we present this work at the, at the laser polishing conference in Germany. Uh, in April, then we further uh, done the optimization. So by optimizing the repetition rate, material melting and uh, ox oxide growth can be avoided. And you can see that um, at the one megahertz rep repetition rate, the uh, surface temperature, the cycling temperature, was exceeding the oxidation temperature. At 500 kilohertz, the cycling temperature is much below the oxidation temperature. And at 100 kilohertz, there is no th heat accumulation. So re repetition rate drives the overall increase in the surface temperature. The first thing we want to change and want to optimize is repetition rate of the laser. And the second thing is that optimizing scanning speed allows for uniform thermal processing condition. This is the difference. On the left, it shows the scanning speed of one meter per second. The maximum temperature is not stabilized after, f after 40 microseconds. 
um, with a four meter second scanning speed, per second scanning speed, we have very stabilized uh, temperature. So scanning, scanning speed dictates the time required for temperature equilibrium. So we got this clear understanding what what's the sensitivity in terms of the laser parameter in terms of the scanning condition. So given this um, result, uh, we also established ultra-fast laser facility uh, by obtaining close to 200% uh, leverage um, from the limited equipment found uh, through a strategic industrial partnership with those companies. Amplitude is a laser company in France. LACI is a beam scanning company also in France and in the U.S. And we have sp sponsorship from a company called OptiPro has been working with us for the last two years. And this is actually uh, also in collaboration with a California company called Nanovia. <coughs> they have provided this uh, uh, chromatic uh, confocal scanning system allow us to measure the surface contour. And there's a donation from IPG Photonics for, to increase our laser capability. So but given that, further we build up a cluster of competitiveness uh, consisting of 10 uh, industrial, academic, and governmental entity to advance ultra-fast laser-based welding for photonics packaging with Lockheed Martin and Corning serve as a material company. And the, uh, the NASA Gather and Gyro Photonics, this is a startup company, they are the end user, they're interested in using laser welding to either weld the uh, integrate photonics or micro optics. With the optic, Optimax, it's an optics company in Rochester. They can provide the optics material. And the uh, cluster also consists of the laser and system level uh, competence, uh, all these uh, small, mid-sized companies. So we're confident moving um, ahead uh, with this research area uh, using femtosecond laser for photonics fabrication. So the summary for, uh, for I'm moving on to the second subject. It's called optical differentiation waveform sensing for waveform metrology. So in this research, we have demonstrated high performance waveform sensing because it, this waveform sensing is required for many applications, <coughs> including astronomy, biomedical visual imaging, and waveform fabrication. We demonstrate a new type of optical differentiation waveform sensor using a far field filter based on small binary pixels. And we have designed and fabricated a filter with a field transmission that's linear with respect to a special coordinate. And the initial measurement uh, has shown excellent consistency, accuracy, and precision, uh, and high potential for freeform metrology. So most of you are very familiar with Shar Harman sensor. That's a micro lens array based metrology. You focus a small beam light into different focal locations. By, by measuring the decentration, you can derive the waveform slope. The limitation of this technology is that the spatial resolution is limited by the micro lens array pitch. That's on the order of 100 micron. The second one is the dynamic range is also limited by the sensing area. If this dot is moving to the next sensing area, you don't know where it's really from. So that's the dynamic range. And the third one is the chromatic aberration. When you use very uh, wide broadband source, the chromatic aberration can be an issue. So we have <coughs> an optical differentiation waveform sensor obtains wavefront slope data by introducing a linear field transmission in the far field. So this is the explanation from geometrical point of view, ge geometrical optics point of view. If you have different waveform slope, local waveform slope, they have different chief ray uh, corresponding to that waveform slope. When the chief ray goes through our focusing lens, it gives different angle arriving at the far field. And then this, uh, if we, you add a linear transmission in the far field, one can encode the ray angle onto the ray transmission. And this transmission is further image to our image camera that can give you the uh, <coughs> waveform slope information. From Fourier optics point of view, uh, if you add a linear function in the Fourier domain, then conduct inverse Fourier transform with a second lens that gives you the phase uh, slope information. Now this is the uh, demonstration for the, uh, the, transmi the uh, modulation in a far field plane. One can add from zero to one fluence transmission by using a filter in a far field. 
and this is the, these are the equation that the wavefront slope can be arrived, derived by doing the ratio between the fluence with the filter and without the filter in the two orthogonal directions. This is a, a principle. The binary pixelated filters have been designed and using a spatial dithering algorithm and fabricated with a conventional lithography technique. So this is the uh, uh, actually fabricated um, filter that has two pair horizontal and vertical and we also have a f uh, 245 degree. These two pairs serves as consistent test and the two ones in the middle are the reference. One has 100% transmission, the other one has 25% transmission. We use that for reference. This is actual measured transmission from zero, zero to one. This is just a microscope uh, picture showing the spatial distribution <coughs> of the opaque of transparent picture. And this technique has the advantage that it's very deterministic and it's low cost. You can just go to a fire, probably you have this uh, ability, RIT has this ability to make this filter. <coughs> and it's achromatic. <coughs> so a first generation ODWS based on a binary pixelated filter with 10 micron pixels has shown excellent consistency. This is a measurement obtained in, in my lab with a 0 90 filter and a 45 uh, plus minus 45 degree, and the difference is almost zero. That means we have a consist consistency measurement for this technique. And now in terms of accuracy, we have a side-by-side -side comparison with a sharp Harman sensor for monochromatic light and polychromatic light. So super accuracy compared to a sharp Harman sensor has been demonstrated for a monochromatic light. The image on the left is the expected waveform generated with a lens that has two meter long focal length. So we have no spherical aberration we have added into the system. And the, the measurement in the middle, uh, this one shows the Sharp-Hartman sensor measure the uh, waveform. And then this is the uh, difference between Sharp-Hartman sensor with the expected. The bottom one shows the difference between the ODWS with expected. So we have a slightly higher accuracy compared to Sharp-Hartman sensor. This is for monochromatic light. And further that, we did a similar measurement for the polychromatic light, and we got very similar results, uh, slightly higher uh, accuracy than the Sharp-Hartman sensor. Further that, <coughs> the experiment also verified that uh, smaller size, pixel size improve accuracy. So we further uh, demonstrate the accuracy with a different pixel size, 2.5 micron, and 5 micron, and 10 micron. And this is a real demonstration for 30 measurements. We have consistently showed that uh, the smaller pixel size that have provided higher accuracy. And they, they all have similar uh, precision. And this is consistent with our modeling. This has been pre-modeled and determined. Um, for free from application, we have used numerical model uh, to test pixel size effect on the measurement accuracy for a sine pseudo wave. Freeform can be any type of, a sine pseudo can be a type of freeform. So this is a sine pseudo uh, generation uh, for uh, the peak of eight radians. And that shows that given our RMS error with different pixel size uh, compared to the expected uh, result. It shows the, the smaller the pixel size, the higher the accuracy. So smaller pixels theoretically lead to a better accuracy. And this is a numerical model backup. Um, the previous slide shows the experimental results, and these two are consistent. We are gearing up to measure uh, free from optics. This is another prediction, everyone's lens, uh, lens that can be generated by use, uh, do, making a face plate. Or you can use this uh, deformed mirror. We have deformed mirror in my lab to generate this free form. And uh, we have <coughs> numerically demonstrated that the reconstructed waveform with a 2.5 micron pixels uh, give essentially the same results as the uh, continuous filter. And the next step is doing this demonstration um, in, the, in the lab environment. So for this line of research, uh, we have demonstrated an optical differentiation waveform sensor using a far field filter based on small binary pixels. 
And the current measurement showed excellent consistency, accuracy, and repeatability. Uh, we believe that this technology has high potential for uh, application in astronomy, the, the, and free from metrology, ocular and biological cell imaging. And because of the, uh, the far field filter, one can actually dynamically tune it to make it nonlinear to decouple sensitivity and dynamic range. Um, so the last topic of my talk is on the coherent phasing of large aperture grading and deformal grading. So I know many faculties at the College of Optical Sciences working on large optics, working on large mirrors. Um, when I work for the high energy laser, we, I, we also work on large optics. But large grading is something that is very unique. Uh, most of you don't get the opportunity to work with large gratings. And the meter size gratings are required by high energy laser and astro astronomical telescope potentially for the next generation. Uh, we have demonstrated a coherent phasing of half meter scale diffraction grating and realized two 1.5 meter scale tail grating compressors. And we have also conceived a new deformal grading based compressor and realized actually procedure optimization. This is related to coherent phasing uh, interferometry and adaptive optics. So the developed adaptive optics design precision control technique can be directly applied to the ultra-fast laser application, the topic I talked at the beginning of my talk. So a little bit back to the fundamentals. Um, we all know that one grating separates different color into different direction, different, different direction. But you, when you have a pair of grating, it actually adds delays to different colors. So you can see that the, the blue and red, the red is going to travel a longer optical path length compared to the blue. So if you have a pulse that has a leading edge as the right color, um, and the, uh, the blue is slow in time, when they come out of a pair of grading, you can actually compare, compress all the color in time. This is called pulse compression. That's how uh, ultra high intensity uh, laser community to generate, how they generate ultra high intensity laser pulses. Because if, if you propagate high intensity laser pulses through a large number of glass amplifiers, you're going to destroy all the optics. So the, the conventional approach is to you stretch the pulse, you propagate them, then you compress them at the end. So these are just the, uh, uh, the angular dispersion in relation to wavelength. And use group delay to quantify the, uh, <coughs> the angular effect from the grating pair. So the large scale gratings are needed to recompress energy. Uh, I mentioned that the C pulse is stretched by a stretcher in, and then amplify a group of amplifiers and go through this full grating compressor. This is the uh, architect architect for the Omega EP for grading compressors. Each of them need to have a size of 1.5 meters. At the end, you get super high intensity petawatt, petawatt um, laser pulses coming out. And the requirement is really tight. You need to have 10 micron focal spot containing 2.6 kilojoule energy. <laughs> it's not something that you see on every, in everyday life. So a grading tiling concept was developed to coherent phase three grading segments. And this can apply for large mirror alignment as well. Uh, we have determined that among six degrees of freedom for aligning your segmented grading, you have tilt, you have tip, you have implant rotation, piston, lateral shift, and they actually form three independent pairs. They compensate each other because two of them compensate each other. You can compensate tip with implant rotation, piston with shift um, by this equation. So once we determine that, we only in situ, uh, we only have three actuators, uh, tilt and, uh, and tip, and we use capacitive sensor to monitor change and to do closed loop measurement. This gave us nanometer precisions. So I have developed our interferometric tiling technique um, <coughs> by building our this is a 24-inch interferometer, and putting the grating into a real diffraction mode um, that allow us to measure the full aperture of the grating. So when you do the uh, the reference beam, is going to interfere uh, interfere with the uh, test beam, 
that is retroreflect by the reflection flight coming back through the grating surface. And this is an interference pattern. So by do Fourier transform of this interference pattern, by analyzing the first, or first harmonic, one can derive what is the differential tilt, differential tip between the segments. And this information is fed back to the actuators at the back of the gratings to get um, closed loop control. This is the final. The coherent phase technique has enabled Omega EP to operate as the world only Kalo drill Padawa laser uh, since 2008. And we have probably achieved 5,000 shots um, for the users around the world. This is the grading compressor. For some of you may have the opportunity to work in a facility like this. This compressor has two layers, probably 100 optics and meter size. And I have personally designed, aligned, and touched every single of them. And this one is operating in vacuum. So everything has to be absolutely correct before you put that into operation. <laughs> and that is a piece of work because it takes seven or eight hours to pump down this, uh, the vacuum chamber. If you make a mistake, it's the whole army of people waiting for you. Uh, so we have, we have the work on the first try. And this is the uh, demonstration of the, if you only have a central tile, one third of the, uh, the aperture, you are going to have a broadened far field. You ha this is a real measurement of three segmented uh, tile grading compressor. We get one single spot. This is in spatial domain. In time domain, we have obtained the same close to diffraction uh, transform limit. Transform limit meaning that if you don't have any phase arrow, that's the best you can get. So we got um, close to, very close to trans transform limit. Um, there's no difference between triple tile and single tile. So there's no degradation of spatial and temporal property due to tiling. Uh, so what, this is the work you were referring. We were the first one uh, achieved in the high power laser community. <coughs> and follow that. The tiling was a great success, but it's very challenging to do micro radiance um, tiling. And I, I was thinking that it would be best we can design a deformal grading, a meter size deformal grading. And even 2008, nobody can make 1.5 meter grading. Today, still nobody can make 1.5 meter grading. So the idea is that uh, we can use actuators to control the uh, grading. So a final analyze, uh, element analysis model was built to predict the surface deformation of a multi-layer dielectric grading due to thickness and coding. This one just shows you that the uh, surface deformation is going to change with the substrate thickness. That means if you put a piece of uh, glass on the this, on this, on this optical table, it's going to sag because of its own gravity. And how much it sag is related to the thickness. So the thinner the, the substrate, the more that surface deformation. This shows it's an inverse uh, raised proportion to the square of the thickness. And also the substrate, the surface deformation is going to change with temperature because when you do multi-layer coating, your coating temperature mostly on the, say, 200 degree or 300 degree. When you use that in a room temperature, you're going to introduce surface deformation. So this final element model allows us to analyze what would be the surface deformation caused by thickness, by gravity, or by temperature. And further with this, we build our optical model in FRED um, by photon engineering <coughs> and demonstrate that grading waveform arrow introduced spatial temporal focal spot degradation. So this is a full model in FRED that can give us the full electric field information, not only the intensity, also the uh, uh, optical path lens and then the associate, um, the face information. So given this, if one have 1.5 meter waveform uh, arrow on each surface of the grating, that's not only going to uh, degrade the focal spot in the spatial domain, um, the fo uh, diffraction limit is about size 2.3 micron, it's going to give you elongate uh, focal spot, but it's also going to uh, degrade the focal spot in time domain from a 0.4 picosecond to almost one picosecond. So I propose to this 1.5 meter diffraction grating uh, architecture to remove the spatial temporal coupling of grading waveform arrow. And this cannot be, I also, we also proved that this cannot be mitigated by using a deformer mirror at the end of the pulse compression. It has to be taken care of on the grading surface. So 
We develop a defect, uh, deformable grading model in ANSYS to predict the surface deformation and determine the actuator displacement. That means that for a given wavefront to be corrected, uh, one can simulate what is the influence function of each actuator. Influence function means that how the surface is going to change when you actuate one actuator. Then you have a matrix to represent how the surface is going to change when you add up all the influence function of each actuator. <coughs> this matrix is going to give us the control uh, actuator displacement based on a uh, known wave font. So in this model, we have taken care of the uh, material property, and also the surface deformation is inverse relation to the, uh, the stress and temperature change and thermal coefficient. These are the fundamentals behind of this uh, uh, final element analysis. Then I work with my student. Actually, I work with a high school student and a freshman um, <coughs> student at Institute of Optics. Uh, we do this uh, genetic um, optimization in MATLAB. Uh, the integrated MATLAB uh, ANSYS model was used to optimize actual location, used to generate uh, using a genetic algorithm. The goal is that you really don't know what, the, what is the best design for the spatial location of the actuator when you first design a deformed mirror or deformed grading. And this, routine, uh, this algorithm allows us to determine what will be the, the best spatial location for these actuators. <coughs> The principle is that we have an initial design based on the wavefront we want to correct. This is my best educated guess. If I have a parabolic wavefront, I say I want to make something like parabolic to correct that. And then this, I set up a boundary condition for each actuator. This optimization routine will generate populations of different configurations based on the initial position and boundary condition. And for each representation of the realization, ANSYS model is going to predict the influence function, and then the influence function is going to be taken into the flight model, the optical model. We're going to predict what's the final optical system performance. So it is really an integrated uh, mechanical and optical model. <coughs> so a diffraction limited and Fourier transform limited pulse was achieved with an optimized nine actual design. The, the left column shows the initial design, uh, the number represents the location of each of the nine actuators. And the, co uh, the middle one uh, shows the residual wavefront. Given this, we were able to correct 1.5 wave wavefront to 0.3 wave. And we were able to achieve two time diffraction limited focal spot, but you can still see the halo close to Fourier transform limit. After this optimization, you got very different uh, spatial. Uh, assignment of the actual actuator location, but we have achieved three times better uh, wavefront residual for the re residual wavefront. We got both uh, spatially diffraction limited and temporally Fourier transform performance. So this is uh, a complete the uh, uh, spatial tempo optimization for the formal grading design. <coughs> so the summary for the interferometric grading. Uh, tiling and deformable grading. Um, because of the desire for meter size grading for hand energy laser and astronomical telescope, we have demonstrated uh, coherent phasing of half meter scale diffraction gratings and realized uh, two meter grading pulse compressor. They are in real operation. We conceive a deformable grading based compressor and realized the uh, actuator position design. So in, in conclusion, uh, we demonstrated an interferometric grading tiling based technique. And we have also demonstrated a novel optical differentiation wavefront sensor based on binary pixel laser filter in the focal plane. Right now it's target for free from metrology, <coughs> astronomical imaging. We developed ultra-fast laser systems, physical models, and processes for advanced optics, photonics, fabrication, and editing manufacturing. And all above, uh, we stayed with the strategy that building strategic inter interdepartmental industry partnership and collaborations with government labs. Um, these are the current uh, collaborative companies. Um, well, that concludes my talk. Thank you.